That's not the right button. Hold, hold, hello! David Snowpick here from Snowpick Games. Welcome to the stream. How is everybody doing? Hey, Adam, how's it going? Ah, I have seen you, Adam, more recently than I have done a stream, which is a, a, a funny state of affairs. <laughs> it's been like two months since I've done a stream. How is everyone doing? According to my little eyeball counter, there should be there should be more more humans out there. Please let yourselves be known, um, so you can get a little character on the on the overlay, and I can know who is out there. Um, yeah. So a ton has happened since my last stream. the The two big things are Godokan, which is where I saw Autumn. and he gave a wonderful presentation about GD extension and getting. Doom to run inside of the Godot editor, which was super cool. Uh, fantastic presentation. Ooh, Adam says that his work on single-threaded Godot is going well. That is great. Um, and the the parentheses there, especially for the web, because the reason that I want that is is for the web. Um, there are uh, situations where multi-threaded doesn't work. I guess with ads, I'm not super familiar about that situation uh, because I'm not one of the people who cares about ads, but um, it makes it um, a lot easier to run the web export. You don't have to have uh, special uh, uh, headers to serve it. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, there's going to be some audio whatever things, I think, because uh, back in Godot three days, the not threaded version had some audio issues, but like for the most part, it'll make it more compatible, easier for people to get their stuff going. Um, so yeah, that's going to be awesome. I'm, I'm so happy that you're working on that, Adam. Um, but yeah, so uh, since my last stream, there was GodotCon. There was the Godot 4.2 release. Um, GodotCon was awesome. Um, I mean, like all things... Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, being around so many people, I always get like a, a little bit, uh, you know, socially stressed out or whatever, just cause I'm not an extroverted kind of person, but it was great to see all the people that I, that I saw and, uh, catch up with everybody and meet the people who I hadn't met in real life, in real life. Um, there are also some really cool presentations, although I'm, I'm sure all of you saw that in the videos and whatnot. Uh, so that's probably like not the most interesting part about <laughs> actually traveling there in person um and you know at the end of it i, I got a little bit sick and uh, i came back and my my whole family had covid <laughs> so it's kind of a crazy crazy return but yeah godot con was awesome um then there was the godot 4.2 release was that just last week but yeah I, that that is a a huge awesome milestone uh, I feel like it was a very stressful release for me personally. Ooh, ooh, new Godot forum. I haven't seen this post yet. I'll have to check that out. I have sort of watched a little bit in the uh, Rocket Chat for the the website team uh, and and the work that they've been doing to uh, get the new forum set up. But I did not know that it was that close. That's super cool. Uh, yeah. So I guess a week ago, the thirtieth would have been last week Thursday. I think. Yeah, it was a kind of stressful release for me personally because I felt like every three to five days there was some like huge critical emergency issue that needed to be handled in some area that I was responsible for. Uh, there was one time when WebXR completely broke. Actually, well, there were a couple of times when WebXR completely broke. One of them <laughs> was Automir changed to switch to the the like P threads proxying thing. Um, and so figuring that out, then there was Bastian did uh, some totally unrelated changes to the renderer that uh, uh, caused it to break because I guess some state, some OpenGL state wasn't getting cleaned up. And I never narrowed down like where the OpenGL state wasn't getting cleaned up, but I found a, a nice spot to uh, uh, clear the state uh, that, that managed to fix it. There was a whole bunch of GD extension things too, where it was just like, ah, everything's broken now and have to go try and fix it before the release comes out. So um, it's great that it's out. And there's also just like some really amazing stuff in uh, Godot 4.2. And yeah, I'm just, I'm really proud of everything that we got done on the GD extension team. Uh, we got, uh, where's our GD extension section? 
We got uh, custom callable support by Mai. We got, um, I guess this is a relatively small thing, but unexposed class registration by uh, Daily Zeline. Uh, index properties. I got thanked for something that I didn't even really do, but that's fine. <laughs> this is something Tomek did, and then I um, uh, did the the GD extension half of it. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's it's a thing. But the bigger things being uh, hot reload, the custom callable stuff w was a big deal. We did a little bit of um, build system cleanup. Adam and Fabio, uh, Fabio figured out how to get GD extension running on the web, which is amazing. Um, so many good things. So many good things. Uh, it, it it it's a really great release. It's also we can we can mark this down in history. The first. Godot 4 release, minor release, where GD extension didn't break compatibility uh, because, of course, you know, in, in 4.1, we were forced to uh, to fix a critical bug. So now we can start building a track record, I hope, of maintaining backward, backward compatibility, which was an effort not just by the GD extension team. Like the whole, everyone who worked on the engine needed to care about backwards compatibility for GD extension in this release, uh, which was uh, huge. Like we had to figure out what that means. We had to create tooling for it. Um, we had to uh, uh, make sure everyone knew the rules for how to use the different systems to maintain compatibility. And yeah, I mean, we did it. It happened. It was awesome. Or yeah, forward compatibility. Yeah, I, okay. So technically, what kind of compatibility is it really? So newer GD extensions won't work in older GD on, on older versions of Godot, which I think is technically backward compatibility. I think what we have is technically forward compatibility. I think I think you were initially right on them because it allows older GD extensions to work on newer versions of Godot, uh, which is really the best that we can hope to to achieve. And there's already like really cool things happening for Godot four point three, guys. Um, there were a whole bunch of rendering things that uh, affect. XR that were basically done before 4.2 came out, but it was already after the feature freeze. So we're like just waiting. We're just waiting until um, the the uh, sort of post release uh, kind of feature freeze <laughs> is done, and so many cool things are going to be merged. So this is technically backward compatibility, like making old games work on new platforms is backward compatibility. Yes, if we're thinking of the GD extension as the thing, then it is backward compatible relative to Godot. But if we're thinking of Godot as the thing, Godot, yeah. Can we think of Godot as the thing? I don't know, this is so confusing. Which direction is compatibility? Let's just have... Let's just not think of compatibility in a binary way. Let's just, we'll be fluid about our compatibility. <laughs> I mean, but there is definitely a direction that it doesn't work, right? Like, okay, so on, if you've got a Windows game and you made it on, let's say, we'll go old school. Let's say you made it on Windows 95 you should expect it to still work on Windows 98. That's exactly our case with Godot and GD extension. But if you made a game using the Windows APIs on Windows 98, you could also ensure that it runs on Windows 95, right? Which is something you can't do with GD extensions and Godot. Um, whatever version of Godot you're targeting, your GD extension will only work with newer versions of Godot and not older ones. So like there is a directionality to it in, in this situation that isn't present always when you're talking about backwards compatibility. So I don't know. I don't know. Godot 4.2 GD extension is allows interoperability with Godot 4.1 GD extension binaries. Yes. And almost perfect interoperability with uh, Godot 4.1 GD extension code. <laughs> At least when we're talking about Godot CPP. Uh, it's it's possible that, you know, Rust or, or some of the other bindings did a better job of maintaining source compatibility. Uh, we're a little bit... Well, we're, we're looser with source compatibility with Godot CPP than we are with binary compatibility. Um, I mean, it's still important, source compatibility, but, like, we're... 
really, really try really, really hard on binary compatibility and then source compatibility, it's like, well, there's a lot of valid reasons where we'll be like, well, this is more right than we'll break source compatibility. But I think that's fine. I think that's the way it should be because binary compatibility, you have no warning, right? New version is out. You move it over. It's there. It should work or not work, hopefully work. With source compatibility, the developer sat down and said, okay, I'm going to update my libraries to the newer version and compile them again. And if there are changes they need to fix at that point, that, that's, that's okay. That's fine. Because you've kind of like opted into that situation. There's sufficient warning. Ooh. Um, like making old games. Backward compatibility is a property of an operating system, software, real world product, or technology that allows for interoperability with older legacy systems or with input designed for such a system, especially in telecommunications. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, okay. So it is backward compatibility. If we're, if we're counting Godot as the operating system, the GD extension is the app. Well, anyway. Moving on. Uh, Godot 4.2 is awesome in summary. 4.3 going to be even more awesome. Godot Con, also super awesome. If you haven't watched the videos, the presentations, I highly recommend it. And uh, yeah, what are we going to work on today? Um, so today we are going to work on uh, a game that I made for the Godot XR Jam last weekend. This was a game jam organized by Bastian Oli and Malcolm Nixon of the uh, XR team, um, which is great. Like, I, I really wish there were more VR-specific jams. The... Um, I think it was the WebXR Discord used to organize XR jams or someone on the Discord organized XR jams. I think that's how I found out about it. Um, but they only did like three. In, in like a normal game jam, you can't make a VR game because nobody will play it. It's like there's no point. You may as well have just picked a weekend for yourself to make a VR game uh, because even if you post it up on on uh, the Game Jam site, like nobody's gonna play it because the people who came, the audience that came, uh, don't have the hardware. But a a XR Jam, like a specific Jam for you know AR VR, all of the people are gonna have at least some equipment that's gonna be compatible with your game, so you can actually get people to play them, which is so cool. Uh, this was the Jam. The theme was Vapor, which uh, is a tricky theme. Uh, I, I came up with this massive list of ideas and then I had to filter them by what did I think I could conceivably actually make in three days? Uh, and it really brought it down to just like a uh, idea. But um, I also did not think of a lot of the amazing ideas that uh, other people came up with, like really, really cool ideas. Uh, I am flabbergasted with how cool some of the ideas are that other people came up for their games that fit that fit the theme. Uh, what I ended up going with, uh, this one is mine, uh, is just clouds. <laughs> Put some clouds in the game and it fits the vapor theme, was basically my, my uh, logic. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the, the core idea that I had uh, was like an arcade Galaga kind of game. And I don't know if everyone here is familiar with Galaga. Uh, I know I'm an old man. And my video game references may not make sense for for everybody, but um, you know it's a sort of it's kind of like Space Invaders, except the the uh, enemies come at you and sort of like fly around and and uh, maybe shoot some projectiles or something. So there is sort of like a uh, bullet hell aspect to it. Like you're dodging these incoming projectiles and these incoming creatures, but otherwise, you know, you're in a very fixed small space. You're you're you don't have full complete freedom of movement. Um, you're just moving around and, and shooting the things. So I thought this would be a great idea for a jam uh, game because um, I wouldn't need locomotion. You're in the plane. All you do is you grab the flight stick and you move it. So there's not a lot of interaction. Like, I don't have to have lots of things to pick up. I don't need physics. Um, and I, I cheated quite a bit in the way that the, the flying works. Um, the, the plane actually never moves forward. <laughs> the world just comes at you, um, which was uh, my trick for, for how to make uh, movement simple. And then you essentially move on a 2D plane that you know is always at the origin. 
you're just moving, you know, up, down, left, right on this 2D plane. And then my thought was the enemies will come at you, and you will have to move on this simplified, you know, not full 3D motion to dodge the enemies, dodge the bullets, shoot them. The thing, of course, is I never got around to really making any enemies. <laughs> I ended up being, like, really focused on the visuals uh, for whatever reason. Um, I don't know if it's just, like, what I was kind of, like, into on this particular set of three days. So uh, I spent a lot of time in Blender. Um, I'm not a great 3D artist. I'm so, like, but I made the clouds. Um, I made on the plane... Uh, the flight stick, I made this, and I modified the plane model, which I downloaded as a CC0 thing, because it had a closed cockpit, and I had to make an open cockpit. Um, so I, I worked on that, but then also just like a ton of just work on trying to make um, the way that this looks nice. So I spent a lot of time messing around with the lighting. I'm doing kind of like a fake GI thing here. Um, there's a trick, uh, which I actually got from the Godot docs, uh, wonderful, wonderful information in the Godot docs about global illumination. Um, having a, uh, a fake GI light that is exactly reverse to the, the sunlight, which has light at a different color. In this case, I, I made it be the blue color of the fake ocean here, um, and at a way lower intensity so that you get, um, you know, uh, light within the, the contoured areas. Actually, let's see what it looks like without it. Well, it's not that bad without it. I mean, it does look pretty flat. And then you turn this on and you get, you know, a lot more definition uh, in there. So I, I don't know. I, I spent a lot of time on that. I spent a lot of time on um, the making the these clouds work. Uh, they are um, particles. It's a GPU particles 3D with a particle shader uh, that's, you know, placing them and uh, uh, moving them and, you know, deciding... Uh, the scale or whatever, but there's 128 of them, which is quite a lot, and it still performs really well on the Quest 2, which is fantastic. Um, and the shader has some special math to make sure that the clouds don't come through this center area. Um, so it randomly places them, but it never places them in the center area. The kind of idea was, because you have restricted movement, right? I wanted to like, okay, we're going to put the player in this tunnel, <laughs> but how do they know to stay in the tunnel? How do they know they can't leave the tunnel? Well, like, let's surround the tunnel with clouds. It didn't fully work. Uh, the cloud cover isn't dense enough, I think, to really let the player know that they can't go there. Um, and so I think it's a little bit hidden that uh, you're restricted. But I don't know. It's it's There's room for improvement. <laughs> um, the first bullet hell. Sorry, I missed your, your earlier uh, comments, Adam. But um, anyway, uh, I spent a lot of time on that. I spent a lot of time on the, the math for how the flight stick is going to work, <clears throat> and how the plane movement is going to work, and how the projectiles work. I should just show you this game. I'm just talking about this game. You've never even seen the game. Um, let me uh, load it up. I'll get casting going. And I can show you while I'm playing. <clears throat> and we're going to do development on the Quest 2. Um, because the, the just the size and the shape of the headset, it makes it relatively easy to rest on my forehead when I'm not hacking. Um, the I did most of the development on this actually on the Quest 3, but like it's the Quest 3 being smaller, I can't like rest it on my head really well. So I have to always like fully take it off and on again uh, when, uh, when I'm switching between testing and, and coding. Um, all right, so let me get the headset on and we'll get in there. All right, just give me a moment to set things up. Already I can hear the uh, the audio on the plane. I also spent like just a ridiculous amount of time on the uh, the audio, which it's nice. It's nice. It, it, it really makes it feel more immersive. Um, and a little bit of time on the haptics. 
Uh, so there's a gun you can shoot, and, and you can sort of feel in the trigger uh, each you know bullet being shot in a, a way that I think is is nice. Is it coming in? Very slowly. Why is this being so slow? Hmm. This content cannot be viewed outside of your headset. What does that mean? Okay, let's let's try. How do I start casting from this screen? I'm sorry, everyone. I always have these dumb problems where I'm trying to figure out this this particular thing. There used to be like a really nice share button on the menu bar at the bottom, but it's gone now. I don't know where you're supposed to go to share things anymore. Camera? Ooh, okay. There's now a camera section instead of a sharing section. Oh, you know what? I bet it really wants us to be on the same Wi-Fi. Ah, oh, crap. I don't like changing my computer's network settings while I'm streaming. I'm going to hit this, and hopefully this won't explode. Stream, I hope you are still streaming. And not that I would see it, but let me know if the stream went down, because that would be helpful information. <laughs> All right, so uh, which Wi-Fi is my headset on? It is not on the same Wi-Fi as my computer. I actually usually don't have my computer on the Wi-Fi at all, because uh, it has a hardwired connection, and having it on the Wi-Fi just makes it do dumb things. All right, so let's try this again. I think we are both on the same Wi-Fi. Cast to the computer. And why didn't it do anything? Oh, oh, another black screen. Hey, okay, we're casting. All right, um, let me load back into the game. We'll just run, come on, start tracking. There we go. Uh, we'll just run the most recent version I installed rather than making the Godot editor push it again. What did I call it? Godot XR Game Jam number one! All right. So here we are on the plane. Uh, the clouds don't all spawn in right away because I'm using GPU particles, and for whatever reason, on the um, the compatibility renderer, you cannot force the particles to spawn from code. Um, there's probably a way around it, like I could maybe set the explosiveness of the particle system to one when the game first launches, and then um, uh, switch it off of that after a couple of seconds so that it goes back to this normal like gradual thing so that you open into a bunch of clouds rather than you know opening into just blueness anyway um i have some hands they are not animated at all they're very simple hands uh, i would like to make some custom hands and animate them at some point there is my flight stick but uh, it is not aligned well let me see if i can realign this ah oh, crap okay step one once we get to coding, is we are going to add a way to recenter the view because it put the flight stick under my desk. All right, but we we can fly from here. So you know we tilt this way. There's a little different uh, sound uh, that changes from when you're tilting. It like turns the wind up a little bit. We can dive down and it changes the propeller sound to be a little bit higher pitch when you're going down, and uh, a little bit lower pitch when you're going up. Uh, there is a thing to shoot at. There's this, like, UFO thing down here. Let me get it on screen. It flies super erratically and is actually really hard to hit. Oh, well, there we go. Now I'm hitting it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. But yeah, this is not the type of enemy that I originally envisioned for this game. It just was an easy one to create, and it kind of fit the vibe of... Um, 
you know, I want to be fighting aliens. I like the idea of you're in a, a propeller biplane <laughs> fighting these aliens that like move strangely through the sky. Um, so that's, that's kind of, uh, the idea of where I'm, I, I want it, uh, the, the vibe I want for the game. So ooh, that's a tiny cloud. Uh, so I spent like a ton of time on getting the, the flight stick moving in a nice way and then having that affect the plane in a nice way. Um, I'm quite happy with the math for that. If you guys are interested, I can show it uh, because, you know, I put a lot of time into it. I want to make I want to milk that time for all it's worth. Uh, but yeah, so. Um, things that I would like to add that I'd like to work on today is a button to recenter. We're going to do that. Uh, some enemies that fit the kind of Galaga, uh, like combat that I want to have. So I would imagine like a stream of enemies moving in a line. They sort of come at me and then go back around and then sit in front of me for a little while so I can, you know, shoot them there for a while. Maybe they stay there and shoot projectiles at me. Maybe they fly out again, do another round. Uh, but yeah, that sort of arcade shooter style thing. Ooh, look at this cloud. This cloud's enormous. Can I fly into it? I shouldn't be able to, but I, I think I might be able to. Yeah. Yeah, the shader is not supposed to put clouds that I can fly into, but there's clearly some, <laughs> there's clearly some bugs in this shader. So, all right. Hey, Logan. Hey, Ashton. Hey, Tony Manblast. Welcome to the stream. Didn't know that the Quest 2 was so cheap. Yeah, so there was a deal. Uh, so right now, I think it's $250 is the list price for the Quest 2. And there was a deal over Black Friday, which you could actually get it for $200. And this is a brand new one. Uh, you can get used and uh, refurbished ones for, like, way cheaper. My um, uncle managed to pick up a Quest 2 for, like, $100. Uh, the Quest 2, I wouldn't necessarily recommend getting it because uh, the Quest 3 is just astronomically better. It's also a lot more expensive, though. But uh, the rumor, the rumor is that uh, Meta is going to make a Quest 3 Lite that is priced competitively with the Quest 2's normal price, which is like $300, um, that will have the same, uh, the same chip in it. So um, it's a system on a chip, so combined, you know, GPU and, and CPU, uh, and the Quest 3's uh, chip the gpu is two and a half times more powerful than uh the quest 2s and the cpu is just like 20 percent better or something it's like a real incremental improvement but the gpu is astronomically better such that i expect it to be not terribly long before there are games that only run on the quest 3. um who knows how long but like if you buy a quest 2 it might be like a year later and there's games you want that you can't play um so that's 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 what I would say, but the price you just you just can't beat it. Uh, da, 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 da. Things have been well, Tony. I hope things have been good by you as well. Good morning, Logan. Uh, oh yeah, you should totally check out the game. Although it's not very interesting, there's not a lot of stuff in it. Uh, like I was saying before, for whatever reason, I got like really deep into the visuals uh, in this game, and I didn't leave a lot of time to put some game in the game. Uh, it's hard doing a 3D game solo. Like uh, 3D just like everything takes so much more time. Like the the working on the the movement and the art and everything. It's just hard to get done. I, I, I think for 3D, it's probably best to have a team. So at minimum, you can have one person who's focused on the visuals and one person who's focused on like the gameplay stuff. But even more people would be better, right? Like if you could have someone who's focused on all the like nasty programming that has to go into 3D uh, uh, games, and then someone working on art, and then someone working on like the design, maybe, and the you know making the uh, uh, levels and stuff. But I don't know. Got something done. So that was that was that. Uh, Ratala. Welcome to the stream. If I forgot to welcome you already, can you get out of the plane? No, you cannot. This is a jam game that I made in three days, and not getting out of the plane was a key design requirement for being able to get it done on time. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. 
That'd be cool. And you know, actually, like, I don't mind that. Um, uh, so Logan had said he's more, more focused on visuals, and so like we should totally jam together. I, I don't mind being focused on on visuals. Like it was super fun actually to focus on that aspect of the game because uh, I got to think about lighting in a way I don't usually do. I got to be in Blender like a lot of time and do all these things that were very interesting. But it's just if you're trying to actually have something done in the end, you need to have like one person. We we would I would needed. To, to have had another person to do the gameplay or again like on on a team uh with someone who is better at the visual stuff than me which you most certainly are logan um <laughs> it would be good to have uh uh you know you doing the visuals and me doing the 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 programming or something like that and then we could split up the design or i don't know maybe we could another member i don't know so many options but um yeah uh let's dig in here we're 30 minutes in and we have not written a line of code or edited a node or done anything. So, uh, what shall we do? Um, like I was saying, we need to be able to recenter the view. Bastian did a stream this morning uh, where he was playing the different games from the, from the VR Jam, and he played my game, and the first thing he's like, there needs to be a way to recenter this. I'm like, oh god, I know there needs to be a way to recenter this. Uh, so it should be relatively easy to add. I don't exactly remember the math for it, but uh, we did it in um, the uh, space uh, uh, game. Oh, I wanted to say something about that, actually. Um, so do you guys remember uh, the last stream that we worked on the space game? The, it, you know, it's a VR, you fly through space, shoot things kind of thing. Uh, we worked on... Um, I, I just wanted to add an explosion... And GPU particles didn't work in VR. And then I spent the whole rest of the stream editing Godot's source code trying to fix GPU particles. <laughs> first of all, first things first, I'll try to not let that happen this time. If we've hit a Godot bug, we're leaving it. We're not fixing it. We're going to keep going. Because like on that stream, we could easily have used CPU particles and like just kept making the game. But anyway, <laughs> that ended up consuming my whole like brain for five days straight until I fixed that problem. And it got, you know, it, it's in Godot 4.2. It got cherry picked to Godot 4.1.3. But if we hadn't done that and I didn't have GPU particles, I don't think this game would have been totally possible, at least not the way that it is with these 128 clouds. Like, so... Number one, it was awesome that we did that. And then what was the other thing? Um, there was another situation just like that. Oh, in the stream before that on the space game, I ended up getting obsessed with why the the projectiles moved weird. And uh, it turned out that like when the ship was in motion, we needed to do some special math where we added the velocity of the ship to the projectile um, to, to make it, you know, look right and feel right. And I ended up being able to use all that same stuff in this game because I had the same problem when I was, you know, originally shooting from the ship, um, uh, having, having the weird motion of the projectiles. Anyway, the, what I wanted to say was the work that we did on stream on that other game directly went into making this game possible, which is super cool. Um, and I'm just excited about that, and I wanted to tell you. That's it. <laughs> All right, so we need a way to recenter. Uh, da, 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 da. So I believe there is some signal on XR server or something to say that the game is requesting that we recenter. It is not on XR server. Um, well, that's okay. Let's let's take a look at the actual code for the space game because I know that we made this for the space game. I'm just opening it up over here, and then I'll move the window over to there. And I think it was probably in our main or our ship, spaceship, GD, is this the one? <laughs> Do we have a main? We have a space. All right, space.gd is acting as our main. It's doing some WebXR stuff. Recenter on HMD. Center on HMD. Reset but keep tilt true. I thought there was like a signal that we would get like when the player is holding the um 
like the Oculus button or whatever to recenter you. Ah, uh, we may have to Google a little bit. Oh, Adam, catch you later. Thanks for coming. Uh, da, 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 da. So let's go look at Godot. Uh, let's say XR recenter. Hmm. XR tools, action map. Oh, or it's on the uh, OpenXR interface. I bet that's where it is. Hang on, let's let's check OpenXR interface. Pose recentered informs the user queued a recenter of the player position. All right. Uh, that's not totally going to help us though, is it? Because we uh, the game also supports WebXR. So we're going to need uh, a couple of ways to force the view to recenter. So I think what we'll do is we'll use that signal in OpenXR, but then in WebXR, we'll have like uh, if the player holds the A button for two seconds or something like that. Um, since we're testing on the Quest uh, in native uh, like Android mode, uh, we'll start with this pose recentered and we'll do the button one second. So, where should I put this? Oh, is this the same game? Yeah, it's the same game. Plain main. Main. All right, so we set up OpenXR, set up WebXR. I guess that's where we'll differentiate here. So open XR, and we are going to connect that signal, open XR interface, pose, what was it? Um, pose recentered. Pose recentered. Connect, say, on recenter player. Sounds good. Let's jump down to probably, let's say, before. No, I'll do it after all this WebXR initialization stuff. On recenter player. And then apparently, I actually thought that we had to do some math to do it, that we had to like move the XR origin by the inverse of the player's, uh, of the camera position, but then like eliminate the y difference and one of the rotations or something but it, it looks like in the space game we had this uh function that we can just call so let's just call that see if that helps and we'll print something here um recentering just so that we know that something's happening in case this doesn't actually do anything and doesn't work preemptively debugging and let's send the game to the headset as i always say uh if you're watching the stream and you haven't yet please say hi in the comments because i don't know who's there unless you say something and it's really cool to know who all is there and where all you folks are watching from actually it's super cool just to to know uh who you are and and where you are all right i think the Ooh, hello, the clean. Welcome to the stream. I think it sent it to the headset, but I'm not getting anything. Let me go through here and see what's going on. All right, I don't know. Yeah, it looks like it started again. This appears to be running. So, okay, I'm going to try holding the Oculus button. All right. Um, does that help me? Okay, well, let me back way the heck up, and then I'll recenter. Oh, I just realized I'm not streaming to you guys. Okay, yeah, that does work. That does work. So I'm able to get the the uh, flight stick out from under my desk. Um, I don't know if you guys are actually in interested in seeing that in action, but I can uh, can get it up on here. In theory, this should be working. Let's 
refresh the page. Hey, there we go. All right, so I am right by the flight stick where I need to be. If I back up a bunch, recenter, and that didn't work this time. Hmm. Sort of worked. I wonder if part of the problem, too, is that we just need to be closer to the flight stick. Okay, so let me say I go way up here, and I hold it, and then it just shoots it way out there. Let's, um, I move back here, recenter. Yeah, I think it needs to be closer to the player. I think that'll make it easier. Oh, and streaming stopped. Lame. So let's go to... Uh, is it part of the plane? It is not. It's in the main scene. Okay, here's the XR origin. We need to zoom way in here. And let's go orthographic. And we will move this. Maybe there. Hey, NEP, uh, is, is assuming you're the NEP that I think you are. It has been quite a long time. <laughs> oh, what did I hit? I hit something weird. All right, let's give this a shot. Oh, the plane is gone. I'm flying through the air without a plane. Oh, my plane's way down there. Wow. I wish you guys were seeing this, but you're totally not. All right. Okay. So I start out decent space from the stick. Let me back up, recenter, and then it ends up right here. I think we've done it. What happens if I just turn like this direction? Yeah. Yeah, it works. Okay. We've done it for OpenXR. Let's do it for WebXR. This one should require just a tiny bit more coding. We will have to set up a little timer. <laughs> you assume correctly. How do you know what I'm assuming, Nick? How do you know? It is very nice to see your text. Uh, are you still in the Milwaukee area, out of curiosity? I am not. I'm way up in... in Appleton. Oh my gosh. How did I get tangled like this? I don't even know. We'll just leave that. <laughs> when I tried your entry, the stick was on the edge of stationary play area. So yeah, I think it's a good idea to move the player forward. Yep. Final turn. Welcome to the stream. Pog champ? I, I don't understand your cool kid vernacular. I am, I am out of the loop. But yes, I am streaming. It's been a long time. It's been like two months. It's crazy. Um, all right. So uh, what first? We need a timer. And this is going to be recenter timer. And let's say the player has to hold the button for two seconds. Uh, it is one shot. We're going to connect it to the method that we just made. What did we call it? We called it on recenter player. On, oops, on recenter player. Yep, there we go. So we need to connect to the um, the. I guess we'll do it on both sticks, the left and the right controller. Um, should I use the same method, or should I make them separate? I'm going to make them separate, just because I almost always end up doing separate things for the left and right hand. It's not really needed in this situation, but let's uh, left controller button pressed, sure. Right controller button pressed. Or wait, left controller, left controller. Now let's go to the right controller, do the same thing. Uh, okay. Let's 
So that should have created all our methods down here, which it didn't do because I didn't notice this note that says we're not connected to the editor. Retry. Lame. So, so how lazy do we want to be? We could be really lazy and just redo that so it'll write the, the functions for us. I'm feeling pretty lazy. Are you guys feeling pretty lazy? All right. Let's just do that again. Yay, it's writing code for us. Okay. Ah, Nick Stilmari, Stilm Brewers Hill, working for a California company, ter churning out Terraform. Yeah, I kind of hate infrastructure. Like, it's fun sometimes, but like working on infrastructure stuff, I just, it's not for me. Software, software is my jam. And I know like with Terraform and similar tools that infrastructure becomes kind of like software, but I don't know. Uh, I'm working primarily these days for W4 Games, and there is a two-person infrastructure team that handles all of that magic, and I am I am very happy for them to exist. They are amazing. I hope they are never sick, especially during an emergency of any kind. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll I'll write I'll write the Helm charts for for my stuff, and uh, I can get in there and and poke on things when when required. But I just don't enjoy it. I just don't. It's not. Uh, yeah, I don't like it. All right, so we are going for the A button. Which what do they call that in the action map? I think it's like A X button or something like that. Where is it? Uh, touch controller. No, I think I want to look at the action set. Yeah, okay. AX button. Not touch. AX button. If P name equals AX button, then we are going to start our recenter timer. And I don't know why it's not auto-completing for me. Oh, because I haven't saved this yet. All right. Recenter timer start, and we'll do that for the left controller. Oh, that's released. I've confused myself on which is pressed and which is released. Let's fix this. And here, okay, and then we're going to do kind of the reverse. If we release it, then we are going to stop the timer. Oh, there's a problem with doing this on both hands. What if they go back and forth with what button they're pressing? Like, which hand they're pressing it on? That's a bunch of logic I don't want to write. Uh, all right, right controller it is. <laughs> go back to left controller, disconnect these. Okay, beautiful. Beautiful. Right controller, hold the A button for two seconds, and recenter. Um, we technically don't need this when we are in OpenXR, but um, let's keep it there anyway so that we can test in OpenXR, and we'll do a quick test in WebXR also. <laughs> a, a Twitch emote. Okay, so you, you, you Twitch emoted, and I did see it. Oh, yeah, okay, over on this other window where I get to see... Um, where I get to see uh, the the Twitch chat, I do I see the emote. I see what you're doing there. Final turn. <laughs> Writing infra tooling is great. Actually, applying and maintaining it sucks, which thankfully I can mostly avoid. If you find yourself in MKE sometime, let's get together. Yeah, I really like haven't been to Milwaukee a lot since um, I moved away because like there was this whole pandemic thing that happened right after I moved, and uh, also during this pandemic thing, my folks moved out of Milwaukee. So like when I go to visit my pa, because also during the pandemic thing, my mom passed away. Anyway, a lot of information crammed in this paragraph. Uh, I now don't go to Milwaukee to visit my father, so I, I haven't really been there very much, which is a shame. I need to, I need to go visit Milwaukee. Um, I do. Uh, anyway. This should be testable. We should be able to test this. This should be good. Uh, let me hit... All 
All right, so when this loads back up, oops, let me get it casting so you guys can see what I'm seeing. Hold. Hold. All right. Are you guys seeing anything? You are not. Okay, so I move away, I hold A for two seconds, and hey, two seconds actually feels kind of long. I was about to give up, like, is it even doing anything? Yeah, I think that could be about half as long. I think one second is fine. Let's, uh, let's switch that to one second, and then let's export to WebXR, and we'll try this uh, on the web. Recenter timer, one second, and project export WebXR. Export here. We're going to have to quick start a little web server, which relates to the thing we were talking earlier in the stream uh, when Adam was here, that he's working on uh, single-threaded uh, support for the web export in Godot, which would mean that I wouldn't necessarily need to start a special web server to serve my special headers, although there is the web server built into Godot that I never use. I don't know why I never use it. I should use it, I say, as I am explicitly not using it right now. <laughs> okay, uh, let's open up the browser in the headset. And hopefully it remembers this IP address. Yes, it does. Although that's not the right one when I'm on this Wi-Fi access point. Okay. We will type it. And that needs to be HTTPS, but let's see what happens. Yep. Okay. HTTPS. Oops. Advanced. Proceed. Loading. You guys still seeing it? Okay. Woo. Super choppy. Wow. That is some serious compression. Oh, it looks a little bit better now. All right. Enter VR, allow, and now I'm in VR. Whoa, it put me way up in front of the stick. Maybe that's why I had us starting out way far back there. I'm holding A for one second, and then it recenters. You know what I think we should do? Just like we did in the space game, we should, um, we should recenter as soon as the game starts. Yeah, the colors are all washed out in the web version. I don't know why that is. Does anyone else know? Um, so I'm using the same renderer on the native and web version. And the, the OpenGL renderer is in sRGB space, which can be a reason for the colors appearing washed out. But it's in sRGB space both on the web and native. So like. I, I could understand if that was the reason if I was running one on the Vulkan renderer and one on the OpenGL renderer, but I don't know why why that is here. Anyway, a mystery for the future. Let me let me quit. All right, so we know it works basically the same in WebXR, but it like puts you way too far forward. Um, so we are going to make a slight adjustment. Oh, you know what? We could even reuse the same recenter timer. Or is that a dumb idea? How did we do it in the space game? Recenter HMD, recentering HMD. So did we like just defer it so it went a frame after we started? Or oh, we did a little countdown. Countdown to recenter HMD. We did it on the third frame. That's so weird. I wonder why we did that. 
I have to watch the old stream <laughs> and see why it had to be on the third frame. <laughs> yeah, you should totally come up to Appleton sometime, Nick. It, there's nothing here. It's horrible. I don't know why anyone would come here or live here or anything. But, like, yeah, you should totally come up here. <laughs> I mean, Appleton's, Appleton's fine. It's not, it's not the place for me, I don't think. But uh, it's fine. It's a place. There's people in it. Most of them are good people. Except for all of the ones with the giant Trump signs. I could maybe I could maybe avoid those people harder than I already do. Anyway, I'm going way off track. Um What is I doing? Okay, we're gonna we're gonna try uh recentering when the game starts. And I'm just gonna do it. I'm just going to call the the the, the function and see what happens, and maybe that'll teach me why we did it this weird way. Um, so, when's a good place to do that? We don't know we're actually set up until after... So in WebXR, we will be set up when we get to this point. Um, so let's do... Our on recenter player, uh, and for OpenXR, we're set up in this point, I think. Um, all right, let's give this a try. Let's see what this does. <laughs> could be worse. Could be Rylander. <laughs> Appleton really is mostly fine. I, I'm sorry for being so negative about that earlier. Like, I definitely am a Milwaukee person, and it is... Um, it is weird for me being in a city even smaller than Milwaukee. I always kind of, like, my whole life thought of Milwaukee as the smallest city on Earth because it was my city. It's where I'm from, and I think that's kind of a natural way to think especially when like chicago's really close by and it's a much 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 bigger city like i never in a million years <laughs> considered living in a smaller place like it just didn't occur to me and then and then i did okay that it didn't seem to actually load the game or no it must have because i'm no longer have the washed out colors okay so installing to device let's uh let's share this let's see what happens All right, I didn't notice it recenter. Um, let's go look at the logs. It says it recentered, so that's good. Let's try in WebXR, see if it if it also works in WebXR. Uh, export, export project, save. Um, okay, so we'll exit out of here, go back to the web browser. All right, we'll reload. It still seems to be streaming. That's good. Enter VR. And I am not recentered. I'm assuming it called the function, but it just didn't do anything. Oh, I don't have the thing set up to. Um, Minnesols, welcome to the stream. I am working on a game that I made for the first Godot uh, XR Jam. Uh, the goal is for it to be kind of like a VR arcade Galaga style game, um, but I am hung up on random little details as I frequently am. Um, but we're getting there. I'm just trying to make this recentering thing work, and then we're going to switch to making a new enemy. Uh, what do I have to go to this? This, give me that sweet, sweet JavaScript console. Why isn't this working? Uh, maybe because I need to reload the page again? Uh, 
that do anything? It did not. All right, let's... Hmm. Hey, there we go. All right. So I'm seeing the browser window. I'm clicking Enter VR. And it called recentering, and it did not recenter me. All right. Let's do what we did in the space game. We'll assume that the previous version of ourselves was onto something with this uh, three-frame delay. I wonder if there's a, a nicer way to delay three frames, though. Like, it's real easy to delay one frame. Let's just try delaying it one frame. Um, Uh, call deferred. All right, so that should call it a frame later. Or actually, that's not guaranteed to call it a frame later, is it? It's just guaranteed to call it later. Um, let's do await get tree. Um, what is the signal called? Is it process frame? Is that a real thing? Did I just grab some random property? Emitted immediately before node process. Called on every node in scene tree. Okay, so this should... Uh, guarantee us to defer to the next frame. So, project, export, export project. All right. Oop. We will refresh the browser. All right, enter VR, and hey, we didn't need to delay three frames. We delayed one frame, and it worked. Okay, let's commit this. This is this is Git committable. Uh, Looking for anything weird. Ooh, I'll get rid of that print statement. That's a thing I don't necessarily want to commit. And otherwise, that looks good to me. I think we're good. All right, so we have a way to recenter in both OpenXR and WebXR. Let's ship it. Added way to recenter the player. Beautiful. So, um,. Let's work on an enemy. Um, before the stream, I was thinking about this because, like I said, I want this. I want this to be like Galaga. And if you remember from when we were looking at the Galaga gameplay earlier, the enemies do these like really cool curves, like they're they're curving and going around in circles and stuff. And I was thinking like do we need to mathematically model those circles and those curves or can we get away with um you know like frame by frame updates where we say okay we're we're eight we, we have this desired direction to be pointing we're pointing this direction and every frame we we lerp that way slowly um and i think that will be sufficient i don't know I know that the math is simpler if we do it that way. <laughs> Therefore, that is the way we're going to try it at first. Um, so, uh, I would like to make some like cool, like I don't know, robotic looking or like the bug kind of looking aliens uh, from Galaga. But to save some time and getting distracted from that, we're just going to use the good old sphere that I used for this enemy. Um, and this enemy has a ton of logic baked into it. We don't want any of that. Um, so I think we're probably just uh, copy the scene and rip it up and uh, do some new stuff. I think we're going to need a state machine. We're going to need to um, have, uh, I guess, like a targeting state. How will this work? Um, 
So we want to have an enemy spawn move towards the player, do some kind of turn, and then come back to, to the middle. So how, how would we model those states? There is like a seeking state where the enemy is moving towards the player. There is a returning state where they're turning around and coming back. And then a, a I don't know, stationary state where they're going to be out in front of us for a moment. And I like the lines of enemies too. Uh, I think that would feel really nice where you'd kind of just get into the right position and you shoot a bunch of times, you take out a bunch of them in a line. So I think we're going to have to have also like a follow state where all the, um, the enemy does is tail an enemy in front of it. And again, I think if we get kind of like the frame by frame math right, that that should, you know, make those cool uh, uh, kind of, I don't know, lines that we get in Galaga. <laughs> yeah, Nick, thanks for coming to the stream. Um, oh, you guys are, are planning to, to, to visit Appleton? That's awesome. Yeah, definitely let me know. <laughs> Take care. Theme is vapor. I propose to replace the sphere with a steaming teapot. <laughs> Shape is about the same. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> so first of all, awesome idea. Second of all, I wonder if there is a way to integrate more steam into the enemies. Like, what if they were, like, steam-powered contraptions rather than, <clears throat> rather than aliens? I don't know. I, I, I really did figure that there's clouds in it, therefore vapor theme handled. <laughs> there were... I'm sorry, I have to cough real quick. And have a quick drink of water. <clears throat> My throat is very dry. Uh, but th there were some really cool, much better uses of the theme in the uh, in the jam. Um, yeah, mine was very tangential. Uh, okay, so enemy. We will duplicate you. We're going to call it... Okay, new plan. We're not going to duplicate the enemy and change it. We're going to duplicate the enemy to be the old enemy. Enemy old. And we'll need to duplicate the script also. I just couldn't think of a good name for the new enemy. So we'll say enemy old. And then we need to detach and reattach the script. So that it gets the renamed one and not the, um, oh, crap. I detached the wrong, okay. Reattach you. Uh, let's open our new scene, or open our old scene. Brr. Rename some stuff in here. Detach, reattach. So now we'll edit up the enemy scene. Um, all of these timers must go. Collision shape is fine. Mesh is fine. Um, the script is going to need to be really, really redone. Um, we probably don't even want to do the explosion as part of the enemy. Or maybe we do. I'm not sure. Uh, I guess we'll leave that, and we will clear out a lot of stuff here. And we're not going to do the state machine the same way. All right, that looks good. That is completely emptied out. Um, we are going to copy uh, some state machine code that I reuse in a lot of different games from an older game as soon as I remember which game we should steal it from. Uh, da -da -da -da. Let's make a new terminal. 
So it is Snowpack State Machine, but I tend to change it a little bit each time I use it, uh, which is certainly not the most organized way to reuse code. Tiny World? What is Tiny World? I don't remember that game. Um, hmm. Oh, here's the Godot 4 branch. Let's just copy the Godot 4 branch from the main repo. Looks like I were... Uh, first pass at porting to Godot 4, largely untested. Great, great, let's use that. Um, we will copy that into XRJAM1 assets. Uh, and we probably want to remove... Or no, I copied the assets directory in there. That's not right. Um, okay, let's go fix that. Assets. Uh, move. Wait, why is it called assets? I'm so confused right now. Hang on. Snowpack state machine. This should go in the add-ons directory. Was it really called assets in the other one? No, okay, I copied add-ons into assets. Yeah, okay, that's where I went wrong. <sighs> Sorry, everyone. The the usual uh, IQ drop once I get on stream. Okay, so we have the state machine and the add-ons directory. Uh, while I'm in here, I'm just going to add these enemy old scene and script to Git. That looks good. Let's go back to Godot. All right, so the way that my state machine add-on works, which I think we need to uh, enable, is that we get a new node type for a state machine, and then we add these state nodes to it. IQ drop when I get on stream, the reason I've never attempted it. <laughs> you know, streaming is so fun, though. Streaming is super fun. Um, I wouldn't have done it 98 times if it wasn't super fun. I, it definitely... Uh, it was, I, I, didn't, I didn't enjoy it right at first. <laughs> it took a little while for it to warm, to warm on me, but uh, yeah. Okay, so... We have like a seek state. Um, okay, I think we're going to have to have like intermediate state. So I'm imagining <clears throat> we have a row of them coming. The lead one is in the seek state where it, it, it rushes at the player. Then it's in some kind of return state where it comes back to the to the middle, but it still needs to be targeting some kind of general place up into the last moment when it's going to pick a place in like some sort of grid where it's going to hang out with the rest of the enemies. Um, at least that's the way it works in Galaga. The question is, how closely do we want to follow that? So... See if so these these ones are are seeking. Oh, and they're just going straight past. And then that one's spinning around, spinning around. I remember more of them kind of going to settle out in front. Oh, so these ones, yep, those ones go into like full space invaders mode. So I think we need a, a state for moving into this kind of space invaders grid which is different than the the like returning state yeah and the different enemy types moving in kind of different ways i'm not sure exactly how to do that like okay we know they need to be we know we need a state machine 
but how do we still differentiate the way the enemies work? Like, those ones flew in a line and then split this way. That was really cool. Can we make the states more generic? And if so, like, what is managing, you know, the different behaviors? Um, it's like that one where it was a whole row of them coming down, and then every other one split in a different direction. And it was really, it looked really cool too. Like, um, where was that? It was after this, I think. Yeah, those three that kind of came in a group together. Those ones flying in like a like a squadron pattern together. That's not what I was trying to show. Here. Yeah, so they like, they didn't break up all at once. They kind of like waited till they got to a point. Although I guess that could maybe be a timer. Because imagine, okay, imagine each of those is like their whole independent uh, scene with their whole own like unique set of states. You would maybe configure every other one to spawn with like a special property. I'm a left one, I'm a right one. And then after the timer, they split in those directions. I just don't necessarily want to have a unique scene for each one. Should there be... Should there be some kind of manager that's like managing their behavior as a whole? Would that make more sense? This is tricky stuff. Um, although I probably shouldn't get too deep into it in the beginning because that that can lead to a sort of design paralysis. Um, Also, too, like in watching, in watching the way that they behaved as they got destroyed, that makes me think that they're not really doing a follow behavior. So, like, imagine you have the different enemies. If this one's set to do the behavior, and then this one, this one, this one are set to to follow, that will work great so long as they're each following the next point in the chain. Um, when, like, one in the middle is destroyed, if it now switches to following the one in front of it, it's going to move differently, right? Like, it will no longer act like a link in a chain. It will turn wider, it'll move different, like... So maybe this is less... Less about following. Maybe we're like... Maybe we're programming like a set of movements and then they're just playing that back. Although that works much better in 2D space than it does in 3D space. Because like we want the enemies to be attacking the player, right? Um, it's, if you're way up here and the enemies are just like, whoosh, like, what the heck was that? Like, that made no sense. There was no purpose to that. We would want, if the player's up here, for them to come at the player and loop around there, and then the player having to duck underneath to dodge. So we don't want it to be completely pre-programmed. Hmm. Let's start with a simpler enemy. <laughs> I see something like follow curve state when reaches end of curve, go to define place state. Yeah, I agree. I agree the clean. Let's do something really simple. And then um, later we can figure out how to make it, how to make it more interesting incrementally. When you do things incrementally, they're more approachable. So 
Okay, so we have a seek state, which... Okay, so enemy appears. Enemy sees player. Enemy seeks... Is they, are they seeking the player, or are they seeking the position that the player was at at a particular time? I mean, I think we do want to have them seek the player for a period of time. So if you're going up, it should follow you up. But then at a certain other point of time, it should switch to committing to the point the player is at now so that they come in and the player can move this way, right? Um, so would that be like a um, seek player state? And then uh, we'll say attack. We'll call that next state attack. And then we will have um, seek point. And then that will cause it to, to turn around. Will that necessarily give it a curve? Yeah, if we give it a front, if we give it a direction that is facing, and it has to always move forward but turn to that position, we should get a nice curve from that. And then uh, we'll have an idle state. So uh, we head through this set of states. This gives us one relatively simple behavior where they come out, they move towards the player, they commit to an attack, then they seek back to a particular spot, and then they go idle where we can destroy them easily. Like that's the space invaders point. <clears throat> All right. So uh, we're going to say um, seek player can go to attack. Attack can go to seek point. Seek point can go to idle, and presumably idle can go back to seek player. It's going to be a little tricky where, where we pick what point it should seek to, but maybe there we can have like a global manager that maybe defines like some grid points and says, okay, each enemy can pick from one of these grid points and it will only let them pick points that aren't occupied, like that kind of thing. So they end up in, in I don't know, the, 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 the space invaders grid. All right. It has been a long time since I've used my state machine. Uh, let's start adding some scripts. Um, extend script. Ooh, we're going to need to organize these. So let's make a folder. We'll say enemy states. Seek player. What naming convention have I been using? <laughs> have I been using the 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 camel case one? No, I've been using the snake case. All right, so uh, we need to know where the player is. I'm going to move these closer together and. Weird, I have to keep jumping back and forth so far. All right. Um, so we need to know where the player is. What singletons do we have? We have game state, the perfect, perfect singleton for this situation. Uh, and it has the XR origin, which is very nearly the, uh, the location of the plane. But we will get more specific than that. I don't want the the alien to be specifically seeking where the player's body is, although that is kind of cool. There's that is that's a, that's a little bit interesting. But um, let's make a uh, a node for the plane. We will have to set it uh, in our main, same as we are setting the other one. And we'll we'll make it unique to scene. I, I like or uh, unique name. I like using the unique names. Okay, plane. I also kind of wish these were 
first before we do the setup. Not that it's probably going to matter. <clears throat> All right, so uh, the enemy is going to have to have a little bit more information. Uh, we're going to need to know its um, direction. Or no, actually, we'll just rotate it. We'll rotate it to point um, in the direction that's going. And then we can always just use the negative Z on its transform basis uh, to decide which direction we're going. So we don't need that. Um, We're going to need like a rotate toward function, or should we just do that directly? Herm, 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 herm. Um, I'm also don't remember how I refer up to the the uh, uh, thing that we're controlling in my state machine because it has been so long since I've used it. Uh, let me take a look at... Uh, let's look at a really old one. Send this over here. We're going to go look at Monster Revolution. Which is not called that, of course, because that would be too easy! Uh, what did I name this folder? I'm going to do my folders over here uh, where you guys can't see them. Sorry about that. Uh, oh, I did call Monster Illusion. Must have never opened it in VS Code. Um, orc states. So let's say attack. Um, how am I referring to the thing we're following? Oh, okay, I'm doing this kind of thing. All right, some Godot 3 code we will convert. Are the enemies seeking immediately when spawned? Yes, uh, for now. <laughs> I'm gonna have them spawn and then and then immediately seek the player. Um, so, uh, when we enter the state, we don't need to do anything in particular. We're just going to worry about the process function, which we're not using the normal process function. It's like state process or something. Let's go look in here. State enter, state exit. This does... state process, and I guess physics process in this case, because this is movement, which we are doing collision detection with the physics engine. We're not really using the physics engine for, for much, but we are using it for collision detection. Um, so here's our seek player, state process. We are able to get uh, game state plane and its position, so global position we need to how do we model this so we are we are moving forward we want to get to this point if we're below it we need to angle up i guess we need, we'll have a maximum turning radius of some kind uh, maybe actually let's put that on the enemy itself. So like, um, no, not, yeah, it's how far can we turn, um, we'll make that be, uh, an export value. So we'll say, um, max angle which, I don't know, um, so pi is 180, pi divided by 2 is 90, pi divided by 4 is 45, so let's say pi divided by 4, 
Um, and we need a turn speed. Oh man, I, I'm thinking of this in 2D though, like in 3D. What is, I guess it's the angle. It's the angle relative to its local negative Z vector. I guess so. We'll see when I write the math for that. That whole the whole idea might break down, but let's see. Um, turn speed. So this would be like radians per second. And if we say our max angle is what it is, well, let's just sort of do it in terms of that. So. 45 degrees in how many seconds? In, uh, I don't know, 0.5 seconds. Does that math make sense? So then we'll, we'll sort of increment our angle. Okay. Let's start very simply. We... Hey, the Yellow Architect, welcome to the stream. You're surprised to see VR? That's interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, I, um, yeah, I participated in the, the Godot uh, XR stream last weekend. And, uh, you know, I do, I VR. I'm a VR kind of, kind of person. Uh, but thanks for coming. So... Basically, we need to say if we are not on the same uh, uh, y or x position, we need to start to to rotate. So actually, this is kind of nice. We we won't be rotating at all along the z axis. So that actually might make the whole rotation angle thing easier to deal with. Um, so <clears throat> we need to say, uh, la, 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 la. the difference between our global position, say player delta, so vector three for now, uh, the planes global position minus the host's global position, which will give us a, a vector from the, the, um, the enemy to the plane. And if we're lower on the Y, we need to start angling up. And if we're lower at, or, you know, or angling down, or if the left or right, we need to angle in those directions. I'm going to regret that the enemy is a sphere in like four seconds. I can already see this coming. Uh, enemy, you are going to perhaps temporarily become partially a box. Didn't mean to do that. And that's the positive Y. We'll put it out here. All right. That way I will see which way you are pointing. All right. So let's start super simple so that we can see what's happening. We are just going to make the, uh, the, the enemy tilt up or down uh, to face the player. So, <laughs> the clean, I'm using Blender Monkey as my default placeholder. The best choice, the only choice, really. Uh, all right, if player delta y is greater than zero, then we are going to 
lerp, or no, we're going to add. Will adding work? I hate 3D. Okay, so if we're going to deal with this individually, that means we're doing basically Euler angles and we need to pick a rotation order. If we're doing up, down first, and then left, right, that seems fine. Let's try left, right, and then up, down. Okay, I think we're good, again, because we're only rotating on two axes. If we're rotating on three axes, the math for this becomes harder. But I think this is okay. So right now what I'm trying to do for this exact moment is get the enemy to rotate itself to point at the player. Um, and then the next step is that they're going to move uh, forward. So this is going to have the effect of them turning and coming to meet the player wherever they are until they're within a certain distance, and then they're going to change state. But... Um, Right now, I'm just figuring out how to do these rotations, which I think is easy, again, because the, the only caring about two axes thing. So I don't think we actually need to do this as an if statement, right? That just gives us the sign. We just need the sign of the y delta. And we can say host. Um, oh, why did it just put that in there? So we're we're ultimately saying host global transform rotated rotated local. I think. Oh, what? Why is that? What? It's giving me like vector stuff. Okay, let's let's go look in the transform 3D rotated Rotated. I think we want local, right? Returns a copy of the transform matrix rotated around a given axis by the given angle. And the method is I will find it with respect to the to the local frame. Or no, we don't want to rotate the global. Okay, okay. <laughs> we want to rotate the the normal transform rotated and which argument comes first the axis comes first so we're rotating around the x axis so vector 3 we'll let that do some insta float conversions for us and then we're going to rotate by the host uh what did we call that variable uh, turn speed times P delta. I'm going to rename it to P delta. Um, but wait, the direction of this turn is the sign of the player delta of the player delta Y, right? <laughs> and we're going to do the same thing again that was around the x-axis for our, our y-change and then we'll need to go around the z-axis for our x-change no, no, I'm sorry, the y-axis switching between blenders 
uh, coordinate system, like the way the axes are arranged in Godot's is like totally breaking my brain. Um, player delta, and this is our x times our turn speed. Wait, but we need to clamp the total rotation. Okay, forget the clamping. Let's just see something working. That's that's what I want right now. I want to see something working. So let's go to main. We currently have this like enemy spawn thing. Oh, and I'm, this is occurring to me that I want to do this in a branch. So this is going to be, uh, we're going to call this, this branch Galaga style. Uh, spawn, enemy spawn timer. No. Mm, or actually, I mean, no, we don't want to, we don't want to do the spawn timer thing. I'm just going to place the enemy in the scene. Uh, this, uh, this is our enemy, TSCN, which is pointing the wrong direction, but that is fine. We're going to rotate them around. I want to see this from the perspective of the player. Oop, why didn't that work, actually? Oh, because I guess I'm already centered. I'm just really far away. Okay. Where the heck did that enemy go? How far in front of it is it, though? I don't even see it. I think that might be too far. Okay. Let's... Uh, we're missing a couple of things here, though, aren't we? We need to have the enemy immediately switch into... Well, I think it should switch to the first state automatically. I'm not entirely sure. Let's take a look at the code real quick. Um, go to our enemy, our state machine. Um, is there a ready signal here? It does not appear to be. Okay, so we are going to set the state when we start out. Do on ready var state machine equals state machine state machine change state seek player okay let's just see something happen this will all get faster and easier once we have something happening and we can oh you're right that is totally confusing yellow architect having the um oh remy one two three that's a good idea to to how to create a vector looking at the player, turn into a quaternion, and then lerp that quaternion. That is a really good idea. You want the enemy to rotate towards the player with a certain rotation speed. Correct. Hey, Cyber Habanero, welcome to the stream. All right, in theory, this should be loading into the headset or not. I'll get this casting. It is still, there we go, we're casting. And then let me get this to deploy because I, I actually do not see the enemy that we just put out in front of us, which is pretty weird.
Where the heck is it? Put it right in front of us. All right, let's see what's going on with that. Uh, main scene, it's right there. What is your position, though? What is the values, actually? You should only be, like, 80 meters in front. Where are you? Main plane enemy. See anything interesting on the debugger? Not really. What in the heck? Am I breaking it with my, my terrible math? So I would like to see that we're actually doing something here. And I'm going to remove our terrible math. My terrible math. You guys would probably do better math. Quaternions are a very good rotation to lerp. That is true. Although in this case, I don't know that I that I want to lerp. I want them to. I want it to turn at a fixed speed. Okay, so the process is running. That's good. Let's see. Where the heck is this enemy? Oh, I bet it's like way down at the ground. Because I'm looking at this orthographic. 100% that's what it is. Hang on a second. Yeah, I'm actually not sure if quaternions will end up being what we want to use here because... Um, I want it to turn, I want it to rotate at a fixed speed, and I want to clamp its rotation, and quaternions don't make either of those things terribly easy. Um, I think Euler angles, yeah, might be the way here. All right. It is far too close to me. 200 meters sounds good. That sounds great. Um... We will attempt this set of terrible math. Uh, we're going to call this vector to player per... Who was it that said it was named terribly? Uh, the yellow architect said it. So um, we rename player delta to vector to player. And let's see what this does. So I didn't apply any of the clamping. But I would expect it to turn to point to us. Yeah, man. All right, so it's in front. I'm going to go down. Why are you moving? What? Well, that was weird. Okay, what I think I need to do, actually, is we need to get the current set of rotations. So let's say um, ro rotation equals host transform get rotation can I get the rotation can you decompose this into Euler angles for me Godot because that would be nice no that's not what I want transform 3d get rotation What the heck? Rotated, translated, scaled, looking at. Okay, maybe I have to go to basis to get what I need.
get Euler in a particular order. All right. Uh, so I want the Euler angles in X, Y order. And I don't care about the Z. So X, Y, Z. Or Y, X, Z. Euler depends on the order. By default, it uses Y, X, Z. I think that's probably fine, too, honestly. So if we turn and then rotate... I think that's the same difference for us. Let's just do the, we'll do the default, do the default. So rotation, transform, basis, get Euler, and then we need to add, say, uh, rotation, x plus equals this mess and rotation y plus equals this mess we don't mess with the z rotation we need to clamp these so rotation x was clamp rotation x negative host max angle or was it angle max i can't remember max angle positive host max angle is the same for the y so this should define like what its turn radius is um And then, yeah, so this vector is in global space. Good. That's what we need. And then uh, we need to apply this rotation to our original basis. So what methods have we got to do that? We have get Euler from Euler. From Euler. Perfect. So host transform basis equals basis from Euler rotation. All right. And again, I think this works for us because we only care about two axes. To create goal basis, get direction to player normalized up vector and cross product of them. So to get to create goal basis, get direction to player normalized up vector. Yeah, so that would get. That's like the same as looking at, right? This last comment. Let me let me go back a little bit because I missed some stuff. Um, let me remove the state node. I would create goal basis. Then simplest way to rotate would be basis slurp self basis target basis. Yes, yeah, so that would that would that would lerp us towards that at a particular weight. But I want to return it at a fixed. I want I want it to turn at a fixed speed. So a certain number of radians of rotation every frame, because that's what lets us limit the um, the turn radius. If if we just if we just do straight look at and um, and turn there, we could turn further than we want to allow the enemy to turn, and it's by limiting the turn that I think we get the cool arcs. That if if we if we limit how far they're able to turn each frame, uh, I don't know. That's my theory, at least. I could be totally wrong. <laughs> I could be totally wrong, but this is why I'm doing it this way because I want to limit the turn radius of these aliens in order to get nice arcs. I don't want them to be able to, uh, you know, turn further than a certain fixed amount, which I guess is effectively true if you're lerping, but you still need to somehow limit how much you're doing per frame. I don't know. We'll see. 
Daniel S. I remember I used look at function Godot as a life hack to make rotation easy. Look at should be in transform, of course. Yeah. So look at is great. Basically, what that's doing is it's taking a vector to be the negative z of your basis, and it's using a series of cross products to build a rotation uh, matrix out of it to build the a new basis. Um, but I, I just maybe that's the right thing to do, but I just don't feel like it is. Let's um. Let's try this and see what it does. Hopefully not everything explodes. That's, that is always my goal, that not everything explodes. And let's also hope that the enemy doesn't just like whoosh off the screen again. It should just be turning on its local transform and it's pointing the complete wrong direction. All right, so this is good. It is, um, well, sort of good. It's an improvement. It was reacting to our position in not the way that I'm expecting. Okay, so as far as its y rotation, it's basically return, turning the opposite direction than I'm expecting. I'm a little bit confused about the way I place this in the world. So I don't... This should not be pointing positive z. It should be pointing. Okay, so this is that's only because I'm on that type of rotation. If I use local space, that's negative z. Okay, so. Negative z is front. But when I put it in the world, I'm turning it around the other way. How to deal with that? Um, I mean, I can just decide that positive Z is front. That's an option. Or I apply these rotations to the original rotation. But I mean, I always, why is this so weird? Hang on a second. So the, the, the one that appears to be working-ish, uh, or no, is the rotation around the, the y-axis. But it's backwards. But it's backwards, I think, because we're facing the other direction. Hmm. I'm just confusing myself now. I don't know. This will probably become clear to me about 20 minutes after the stream ends. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we are coming to the end of stream time. I I'm sorry that we didn't uh, accomplish terribly much this stream. I mean, what did we do? We 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 recentered. We got a recentering thing work. We had me doing some really questionable math involving rotations. <laughs> Um, 
And that's about it. <laughs> we did get to chat quite a bit, though. That's always good. It was great to catch up with everybody. I will attempt to do another stream next week. I actually don't see any reason why I shouldn't be able to stream next week. The um, GD extension meeting, which sometimes interferes with the stream, uh, is not happening at the interfering time next week. It's happening at the late time, the, the convenient for Asia time. Um, so I think I should be back. I don't know if I'm still going to be working on this. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but anyway, yeah, it was great chatting with everyone. Thanks so much for coming. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> final turn. You're back from after a long break, so I can sit out a win. Yeah, I, I did it. I actually turned up and did it after two months of being away. So, yeah, that is a win. <sighs> Hope everyone has a great weekend. And, uh, yeah, thanks again. I will see you on the Discord or elsewhere. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>